talk today about the importance of belonging and a part of uh, and and the importance of being a part of family. I'm reminded of a story that Dan Matthews tells about his dad, Dr. Matthews. Dr. Matthews was a was a military doctor for years, and then he practiced uh, uh, medicine here in Moses Lake. He delivered all three of our children. And at his funeral, his son, Dan, tells a story about being out with his friends one night and they were out late and they were messing around and they got in trouble and the police picked them up. And so he told the policeman where he lived and the policeman delivered him to his house and they walked up to the front door and knocked on the front door and Dr. Matthews opened the door and the police officer said, Dr. Matthews, is this your son? And he answered immediately, yes, he is. And I love him very much. Imagine the power of that moment. What does it do to a person to know that he or she belongs? One of our greatest longings as human beings is the longing to belong, to know that we're accepted. That moment was forever cemented in Dan Matthews' mind because nothing compares to knowing that you belong and that you're unconditionally loved and that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. There's a lot of research on this topic, I'm gonna to cite some of it today just because I think it's kind of fun, but research shows that female baboons who have a core of female friends show lower levels of stress via their cortisol levels. They live longer and they have more surviving offspring. At least three stable relationships was the magic number in this research. But what about these statistics? The lowest rates of dementia occur among people who are socially engaged. Women who are connected in healthy relationships are four times more likely to survive disease than loners are. Men who've had a stroke, but who meet regularly to play poker, to have coffee, or some other activity with friends are better protected by their social interactions than they are by medication. The research tells us that face-to-face -face contact with others provides uh, stunning health benefits, and yet almost a quarter of the population say that they're lonely and they have no one to talk to. Now, the research that I've just described comes from Susan Pinker's book, The Village Effect, Why Face-to-Face -face Contact Matters, and the TED Talk that she gave that connects to it. It's worth the read. It's worth taking a watch at that, at that TED Talk. But here's a blurb about the book. In this surprising, entertaining, and persuasive new book, psychologist Susan Pinker shows how face-to-face -face contact is crucial for learning, happiness, resilience, and longevity. From birth to death, human beings are hardwired to connect to other human beings. She begins her TED Talk in the following way. Here's an intriguing fact. In the developed world everywhere, women live an average of six to eight years longer than men do. A 2015 study shows that men in wealthy countries are twice as likely to die as women at any age. Why do live, women live longer than men? One major reason is that women are more likely to prioritize and groom their face-to-face -face relationships over their lifespans. Fresh evidence shows that these in-person relationships create a biological force field against disease and decline. Look, here's what we know. We are created to live in community and encourage one another forward in life. We are created for connection. We're built to belong. We might have guessed this because God tells us from the very first pages of scripture in Genesis chapter 2, 18, in which the text says, then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. This is not a good way to live. And what we know about our culture is that while we're more connected in many ways than we've ever been, there are a lot of lonely people out there. 20% of Americans report being lonely at any given time. One of the most devastating things about the shutdown that our society has faced with this pandemic is the isolation and the, and the loneliness that many have felt. And it's difficult at times to quantify, but it's been a really challenging aspect of, of what's needed to happen over this period of time. And so the question is, how are you doing with connection? Are you building healthy and strong relationships? Do you have friendships? Do you have people to walk through life with? People who will stay with you through the journey of life. People who love you without wings. People who will stay with you and not fly away at the first, second, third, or fourth sign of trouble. People who will be with you, a place to belong. 
we believe and we continue to talk about the reality that Moses Lake Christian Church is at its best when all of us are engaged in authentic, life-giving relationships with God and with each other. And we do lots of things to try to keep connected in this community. And some of the things that we do are kind of fun things, simple things that show that we belong. We, we give out backpacks, right, that say Moses Lake Christian Church, and you're a part of it. Hey, we, we have these masks made uh, for this pandemic. Nobody wants to wear masks, but we are all in this together. So we thought, well, you know, that'll be kind of fun. We have shirts that we have done that, that people can wear. We, we want to be connected and we want to belong. And it's important that we belong in, in every really strata of our community. And we understand that Jesus walked in really healthy relationships. He had others that he walked through life with. We need people. We are family. We are created for connection. We're built to belong. But how do we see Jesus interacting with others? Where do we observe Jesus with others? And we have to assume that Jesus was connected in many of the same ways that you and I are connected as he grew up. He had his, his family. He had his extended family. He lived in a village. He was well known for having come from a smaller town. Remember that, that some would say as Jesus was going along the way, hey, we know this guy. This is the carpenter's son. He had followers that went with him through the countryside. As he begins his formal ministry, he chooses 12 men to walk with him. And even within that group of 12, remember he has three that he's closest to, Peter, James, and John. And so we see Jesus connected in community, walking with others as he walked through life. And what are some of the really specific ways that we see Jesus in his ministry? One, one is that we see him in celebration. We see him in celebration with others. You remember the wedding at Cana. This is where the first miracle takes place. And we see in John chapter two, verses one through 11, that this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Jesus went to the celebrations. We can assume that Jesus went to the times of mourning. Uh, we know that Jesus went to Lazarus' funeral, if you remember that story. And so Jesus met people in the celebrations and the difficult times of life. We find Jesus at worship in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 9. It says that, that we, we find him healing in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And in Matthew chapter 13, 54, and Mark chapter 6, verse 2, we find him teaching in the synagogue. And so he's routinely gathering with others in the synagogue. We see Jesus in prayer in Matthew chapter 9, 19, 13. They were bringing children to him so that he could pray for them, that human connection that Jesus made. We see Jesus eating with others. In Matthew eleven nineteen. now this is an interesting text. It says, the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was eating with, and drinking with people often enough that people noticed it and they said, hey, this is what, this is what he's doing. He's gathering with other people. And, and Jesus was often invited into a meal or invited others into a meal. And so we understand Jesus connecting with people in, in, in the ways that we connect with people. And it's an important part of being human. Jesus said to us that we needed to love each other. In John chapter 13, 34, love one another as I have loved you. Pay attention to each other. Be, be concerned for the, the best for other people, the people around you. In John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another. We just finished a series in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And how many times throughout that text does John remind us to love one another? And we can't forget in Matthew 22, verse 34, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's so much that we know about the importance of developing healthy human relationships, from how babies develop to how people get along in life. We're better together and we're called to live well with one another and to love well. Phil and Elizabeth Payne just had a new grandchild just this morning, early this morning, on this day that I'm recording this. And, and he sent a picture to the staff. And I love seeing pictures of new babies that are born because they're always, almost always, being held tightly by their mom or their dad. Because we understand that from the very beginning, when a child is birthed from the womb, 
that human connection and touching is so important to the development of that child. In the book, The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business, the author provides lots of research and studies, but he cites a 1994 Harvard study that examined people who had radically changed their lives. And here's what they found. It was profound. There's something really powerful about groups and shared experiences. People might be skeptical about their ability to change if they're by themselves, but a group will convince them to suspend disbelief. A community creates belief. But we do know that for habits to permanently change, people must change, and that is feasible. It can happen. The same play, the, the same phenomena that takes place in AA, which the power of habit spends a lot of time talking about, is the power of group to teach individuals how to believe, to, to stand with each other, to encourage each other. Hap, change happens when people come together and encourage one another to change. Belief is er, er, easier and it, and it occurs better within community because there are days when I'm struggling and other people can step in and help me and days when they're struggling and I can step in and help them. We are not created to live in isolation. We're created for connection. We're, we're built for belonging. And throughout the New Testament, we see this. Think about the one another passages that we find in the New Testament. What are some of these texts that we see that, that we're challenged to do with one another? Paul and the other New Testament writers have a lot to say about being together. First thing that, they, that I want to note is they say, love one another. Romans chapter 12, verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, not to repay evil for evil, but to seek to do good to one another and everyone, to love one another earnestly from the heart, Peter writes, to keep loving one another earnestly, love one another, First, second, and third John, over and over we're told to love. And then to live in unity with one another, Romans chapter 12, verse 16, live in harmony with, with one another. It's also in, in Romans 15, 15 or 15 verse five rather. First Corinthians 12, 25, you're all members of the same body. So don't let there be divisions among you. Have the same care for one another. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So we understand that that loving one another and living in unity with one another is important. What are some of the others? Cease passing judgment on one another. Romans chapter 14, one, don't pass judgment on one another. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? And then in Romans 14, 13, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. James chapter four, don't speak evil against one another. James chapter five, verse nine, don't grumble against one another. There's an important piece of this that's not passing judgment. And we understand that when we can live in community and understand that we're all in process, then, then that gives us the freedom to belong, the freedom to be who God's called us to be. And then we're told that we should welcome one another. Romans 15, verse seven, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. I love this. Give preference to one another. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. When you come together to eat, wait for one another. The Lord's Supper is, is about being together. It's not about doing your own thing in a large group of people. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Husbands and wives, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Children, um, pay attention to your parents. Parents, don't exaggerate your children. Workers, work to the glory of God. If you have workers, make sure that you treat them well. This important thing of giving preference to one another is so clear in Scripture. 
and then serve one another. Galatians chapter 5, 13 says, use your freedom through love to serve one another. First Peter chapter four, verse 10, use your gifts to serve one another and be good stewards of God's grace. One of the things that we've heard during this time as people have been asked to wear masks is whether you're worried about it or not, there is an opportunity for you to love others just by, there may be people who are afraid. And so how do we serve one another? What, how do we use our freedoms, not, not for ourselves, not, not to, to demand our rights, but actually do we use our freedoms to serve? Then bear one another's burdens. Galatians chapter six, verse two says, bear one another's burdens. Ephesians chapter four, verse two, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And so we understand that we, we see these things that, that we're called to do for each other in scripture. Speak truth to one another. Ephesians chapter four, verse 25, speak truth to one another. Colossians 3, 9, don't lie to one another. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Hebrews 13, or Hebrews chapter three, verse 13, exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sins. And so we speak truth to one another and we forgive one another. Ephesians chapter 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3, 13, bearing with one another and forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. This is a key part of what it is to belong to each other. And then encourage one another in the faith. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, encourage one another with these words. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. I love the, the message paraphrase here. Let's consider how creative we can be in encouraging one, one another and, and, and pushing one another on. Confess your sins to one another. James chapter five, verse 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And finally, show hospitality to one another. First Peter 4, 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. First John 1, 7, have fellowship with one another. It's really important to recognize that we need each other, that we belong, whether it's in your nuclear family, whether it's in your extended family, your church family, your community, we are created for connection. We're built to belong. Susan Pinker, also in her book, cites a study by Julianne Holt Lundstad, a researcher at Brigham Young University. And the study looked at tens of thousands of middle-aged people and asked questions about every aspect of their lifestyle, their diet, their exercise, their marital status, how often they went to the doctor, whether they smoked or drank. And, and then they waited for seven years to see who was still alive. When she looked at the data, she wanted to find what were the strongest predictors of longevity. It's kind of fascinating to look at the study. Here's a chart, hopefully you can see it a little bit, of what she found. But the most important indicators of longevity were social integration and close relationships. I mean, clean air, we haven't seen much of that lately. I mean, okay, it's important, it's in the list. Hypertension, yeah, not, not, not having high blood pressure, that's important, right up the list. To uh, flu vaccine, could be helpful to quit boozing and to quit smoking, those are important but close relationships and social integrations were the two strongest predictors of longevity. This is just how much you interact with other people, how much you belong to the groups around you, how much you spend time with the people who make your coffee or, or the postman or the lady walking your dog down your street, the people you play cards with or meet with in a book club. Who are the people that you connect to? Where are the places that you belong The church? was created for belonging, as our families are created for belonging. So we want to encourage belonging. We want people to know that they belong. Okay, one more study before I'm done, but it comes from, from a TED Talk 
about what makes a good life. And uh, the TED Talk is titled, What Makes a Good Life? Lessons from the Longest Study on Happiness. And the presenter is Robert Waldinger. And the study is called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. They tracked 724 men for 75 years, asking them questions year after year about their work, about their homes, about lives, and about health. They talked to their doctors, they drew their blood draws, they studied their brains. They started in 1938, and the study is still going on today with what, at least when I looked at this TED Talk, 60 survivors who are now in their 90s. So the first group that they started with were sophomores at Harvard College. The second group that they followed were a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods, boys who they picked, were chosen um, specifically because they were from some of the most troubled, most disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s. And they followed these guys along. And you know what they learned? Here it is in a nutshell. The clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, full stop. Belonging, not surprising that we find research matches scripture, that God has told us how we're wired and what we're created for. And so the three big lessons from this are that social connections are really good for us and loneliness and isolation kills us. It's not just the number of friends you have, it's the quality of the close relationships that matters and that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It's something about the way we're wired and created. And so we pay attention to that. Good close relationships are good for our health and our well-being. Over and over and over in these 75 year studies, our studies show that people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, and with community. And so the good life is built in healthy relationships. We're built for belonging. We shouldn't be really surprised when good research matches the wisdom of scripture. Notice what we learn about the early church in Acts chapter two, verses 40, 42 through 47. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done by the, uh, through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They lived and belonged to each other. I want to take us back to this quote from Mother Teresa because I love it so much. She says, today, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. That man, that woman, that child is my brother or my sister. If everyone could see the image of God in his neighbor, do you think we would still need tanks and generals? And so I want to invite you to think about the ways that you're connected. You belong to us and we belong to you. We belong to each other in our nuclear families, in our extended families, in our church family, in our community. There are places that we belong and we're wired for it. We're made for it. And when it falls apart, we're in trouble. So where are you connected? Where do you belong? You know, one of, the, one, one of the things that happens is we'll say, well, you know, I really would like to be a part of that, but it's not a very friendly place, or I don't really feel like I, you know, fit because you're not, you're waiting for somebody to invite. And, and that's okay. And we want to work to invite you. We want to work to welcome you into our community. We want to welcome everyone. But sometimes you just have to dive in. You just have to take a risk on relationships. How are you helping others to belong? If you're a part of Moses Like Christian Church, how are you helping people who walk through the door or walk into the lawn on a Sunday morning to feel that they belong there, to know that they're loved and welcomed? How are you doing that to, at home with your kids? How do your kids feel when they, when they mess up or when something goes wrong? Are you standing at the door when the policeman arrives and saying, yes, that's my son and I love him very, very much? What about in the community or at church? Is, is, is Moses Lake Christian Church a place where people feel welcomed, even, even in their brokenness? 
because church is a place to belong no matter what's happened to us. And what's one thing that you could do this week to dive deeper into community? Maybe it's joining a life group. We're, we're heading into the fall and we're going to re, restart life groups. Some are continuing to go, but we would love to see multiple life, life groups starting this fall. New ones added. There are opportunities to serve and to be a part of a ministry team around you. And then what's one way that you could encourage someone around you and help them to know that they belong? Maybe in your neighborhood, maybe at work, maybe at church, maybe at school. We're created for this. Family is about belonging, whether it's your family in your house or your extended family or the church family or the family of community. We're created for this. We're made to belong. And so we encourage you and challenge you to dive into community. May God bless you as you do it. Mm -hmm.